An amazing record label called The Native Sound and two particular releases of theirs, Vow, which I'll play you some music for here in a little bit, and Koji. Go visit thenativesound.com for 10%. That's right, 10% off of your order. Go there, order some records, and enter the code 100 words. Please do that. It supports the show, and you're supporting DIY businesses like The Native Sound. So do it. Here's the show. One, greetings all. Welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy uh, Labor Day if you celebrate that. I'm recording that uh, today, so I don't have to work. It's, it's nice, you know? Got to uh, take a long walk with the family, you know, do stuff that you don't typically get to do on a regular work day. The guest this week is Mr. Nick Diener. Diner? One of these days, I'm going to ask the people I interview how to pronounce their last name, right? Anyways, Nick is the vocalist slash guitarist for a, I don't know if I would call them defunct. They're on their way to becoming defunct <laughs> band called The Swellers. This was a conversation I was so excited to have. Hold on. Just, just I'm going to put a pin in that. I'm going to get some business out of the way, and then we will talk about why I'm so excited to bring you this conversation. So, like I was mentioning at the top of the show, there's an amazing record label. They've been supportive over this show for a long, long time, and they decided to come on board as a sponsor, and I couldn't be more grateful and thankful. And from the bottom of my heart, I am telling you, the stuff that he is putting out is incredible. The label's called The Native Sound, and they're from Brooklyn, New York. Great stuff going on. The first release that I want to highlight is a band called Vow. They are from L.A., I have yet to see them play. They played a show I was at, but I was late. That was my fault. But I've heard great things about them live, and I pre-ordered this EP personally. I think there's a few copies left on the most limited edition color vinyl. It's like pink with splatter. It's, it's probably going to be beautiful when it ships. If you are a fan of Slow Dive, Cocteau Twins, Purity Ring, Churches, all that sort of like atmospheric, electronic, cool indie rock, that is exactly what this band does. Here, I'm going to stop talking play this song i think in the middle of it you'll probably be running to the website to pre-order the copy so here here's a song i'll talk to you in a minute awesome. Like I said, I printed my copy. And if you do so, enter a coupon code, 10% off, which is like, you know, I mean, whatever, 10 bucks, it's a dollar. That's not that big of a deal, but it is for the person running the label. They're giving you this exclusive code. Type in 100 words at checkout and you will receive 10% off, which is basically kind of like free shipping, which is awesome. You don't have to pay that's like you showing up at a record store and getting it for cheaper than you would at a record store. So just do it. Like I said, limited edition vinyl. It's beautiful packaging from what I have seen online. And also, Koji, a future guest of the show, he's going to be on in the next, I don't know, month or so. They re-released an EP called Some Small Way, and it was originally released by Run For Cover, but it was only on cassette, if I'm not mistaken. And he decided to do a very, very beautiful package, 180 gram vinyl, great artwork, some digital bonus tracks. So like I said, just go to the website. You will find great stuff there. Thenativesound.com, 100 words at checkout, and you'll get 10% off your order. So do it. We love that label, and you should as well. I got to tell you about something. So I did a three-day juice cleanse, and that was intense. I know a lot of people have so many, uh, you know, misgivings for a cleanse. I mean, let's be honest, that sounds terrifying. Not eating food for three days. It was intimidating, but I loved it. 
I loved how energetic I was. I loved the feeling that I had while I was on it. It's, I don't know, it was incredible. It was something that I didn't think I would enjoy as much as I did, but holy crap. So if you're curious, you know, just email me 100 words podcast at gmail.com. We can talk about it. Or you can be like, hey, that was a stupid idea. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's, that's your opinion. Visit propertyofzach.com. Also, we are doing a weekly digest. I'm sending out an email every Monday, just kind of, you know, recapping the shows, talking to you about some sort of behind the scenes stuff on what it was like to set up the interview or what happened at the interview, just kind of a more casual dialogue about the show. Uh, Go to the website, 100wordspodcast.com, and on the right side, you can sign up for the email newsletter, or if you're feeling ever so generous, donate to the show. And two particular people that I wanted to mention, Kimmo from Finland. He's become a regular email buddy. Thanks, Kimmo. And he also donated the show. Thank you so much for that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And Dane, exclamation point. He was a very kind gentleman and popped on the iTunes store and left a very flattering review saying, one of the most relevant and interesting punk rock podcasts, which I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot in the game now. Over the past like year and a half or so, there's been a lot of uh, different people who have picked up the torch and are talking about independent music, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm happy for that. And it's also very, very nice to see that people who have joined this show early on are still listening. So thank you. And uh, yeah, like I said, email the show 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. Okay, business is out of the way. Let's talk about Nick. The Swellers, as some of you may or may not know, are they're on the verge of breaking up. They're playing some final shows over the course of the next like a year or so. And they, they've been a band for 12 years and they're just, you know, calling it quits. So it, it was it was interesting because I got to work with the band a little bit towards the tail end of their their musical careers. And I, I felt like I was afforded kind of a peek into what a band of their size goes through where it's like, you know, they never really made it big, quote unquote, and they had a lot of opportunities, but it just never took that next step. Once they announced that they were breaking up, I emailed Nick and was like, hey, man, do you want to come on the show? Like, let's talk about this. Uh, Because I had his brother on, oh, man, uh, this was probably like a year and a half ago. I want to say it's like episode 22 or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but you could dive back in the archives. I just wanted him on because I wanted to see if he opened to have a a candid chat on why the band is, is breaking up. And then also just kind of find out more about him. And I don't know, just I felt like it was a perfect timing. He was like, you know, I need to wait a minute. I want to let these these thoughts settle in my head before I really, you know, put it out there for the public to consume. Yeah, but Nick was Nick came on and we had a very, very open chat about stuff that honestly bands just don't talk about out in the open. Um, Stuff like jealousy. Like when you see if you're in a band and you see your friend's band becoming more successful, there's a weird feeling where you're like, I'm happy for them, but I want that. So we dive really, really deep into that. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to bring it to you. So without further ado, here is my discussion with Nick, and I'll talk to you after. It feels like love, and it fits like love. And when you drop all of the fingers, it's not the same. Wait for a better hand to play. I usually start these things off with just my own personal entry point to kind of, you know, you, the band, all that sort of stuff. Because I, I mean, obviously we had never met up until you came into the, the PETA office and we hung out and, you know, you, you, we did that interview and stuff. But I had been aware of your band for years and years. I think it was Ups and Downsizing was the first record I really kind of got into, even though I still have My Everest on, on vinyl. I think I just ordered that off of a, a whim. I was just like, oh, yeah, it's cheap. I'll buy it. But oh, nice. <laughs> but it was one of those things where it was palpable as far as the amount of attention that started to be poured onto you guys in like you know the t- whatever 2007, 2008, 2009 uh, time frame. And it was uh, the reaction that I had was like, "Oh, Swellers are a good band," but it never. You guys never made me do like the holy shit moments until later on, like especially mm-hmm. especially with your last record. But I always found it so interesting with you guys where it was like, since you were a band that could play essentially to anybody that likes like somewhat aggressive music (laughs) right right where did you initially find the pockets of kids that were into you you know because it's like oh yeah you could be like the pop punk band you could be kind of the punk band um i don't know i just i found it interesting once you guys started to play to a wider audience like who'd you find you know when you were playing in front of paramore's audience like what kids were coming up to you afterwards being like the most engaged and stoked man i think like you know the paramore tour for example is one of the 
first really, really big things that we did. Mm. Uh, you know, before that, we toured with some bands that were, you know, a little bit bigger than us. And before that, you know, a lot of self-booked, you know, hall shows, uh, U.S. tours on our own, things like that. So getting on that Paramore tour, you know, we had been used to, there's like a handful of like skate punk kids that had been listening to us since like, you know, 04 to 08, right. I want to say. And uh, and I mean, seriously, when I mean a handful, I mean, there's like 12 kids who like skate punk left in the entire US. Right. And then pro- there's probably like 16 or 17 of them in Europe. And uh, sure. So, oh, and then like there's four in like Western Canada, right. by the way. Um, I've, I've seen them all on Twitter. I know that they exist. But yeah, so Paramore kids, there were the kids who would come up and say, this was my first concert I've ever seen, meaning you're the first live band I've ever seen. Uh, there were some of those kids, which was crazy because it's like, wow, we opened you up into the world of live music. So when someone says, what was the first band you ever saw? Uh, it was us. So that was pretty mind blowing. Right. Uh, another one, you know, there was another group of just like screaming boys and girls who were just like, they were on stage. That's crazy. I need your picture. Uh, I'm going to forget about you tomorrow, but right now I'm really pumped to be in front of you. You know, so we had those kind of, uh, people that were really pumped. And I mean, we still, you know, enjoy those people because they made our experience a lot more fun, you know, getting a lot of attention and people saying you guys rocked. I mean, of course it feels good. And, uh, we would just do our, we, we knew they weren't going to be around very long. Right. So we were kind of like, yo, let's sell them a record. Come on, man. So like that first record ups and downsizing every single person were like, you want a record? And we were selling like 100, 120 records a day um, on that tour just because we were just, you know, I, I we weren't so much hustling as kind of just being like, hey, like we also play music in addition to taking pictures with people. Right. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that went pretty well. You know, it was fun. And then there was, uh, you know, some people at the Paramore show who were like, you know, the older guy who brought their girlfriend or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they came up to us and they were like, you guys are too good to be an opener. And we were always like, what? Like, what is that? And they're like, you guys sounded better than some of the other bands on the bill. And like, you just had this better stage energy. And I was just kind of like, you know, and that's not for me to admit like, yeah, that guy's right or whatever. But I was just (laughs) like, wow, cool. Thank you. You know, it's a really cool compliment just saying, you know, that we should have been higher on the bill, you know, even though we weren't a more popular band. And uh, that was actually a compliment that kind of carried over through all of our tours, I noticed, Uh Uh, because we opened a lot of tours and played second, played third, whatever. And we got a lot of, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but people just saying, I usually hate opening bands. I'm like, what? Yeah. But dude, every every one of your favorite bands was most likely an opening band at one point. And then they're like, man, you guys were great though. And we're like, awesome, man. Thanks. Well, that, that, that's, a, that's a super interesting point because I, I think the need to kind of prove yourself when you are opening and when you do kind of have, you, you wear that sort of, you know, badge of honor where it's like, dude, I honestly think we kind of played that band off the stage tonight, whether it's the headliner, whether it's the band that's playing right after you and not from like an egotistical standpoint, but just like a, physically, I think we played better. <laughs> like we, we executed ourselves more musically sound than this other band did. Um, but we're playing before them. And that's awesome. Right. And I mean, that's kind of, you know, obviously, it's not a competition in that sense. But like, it's so cool to just know in your heart that you did that. And actually, you know, some people in the audience will pick up on that. Like, I mean, there's a lot of bands that are headlining stages right now that are just staring at their instrument, not moving around. You know, they're, they're nervous, they're kind of making sure they play all the right notes. You know, front man might be going crazy. They're just singing into a mic. That's cool. But like, my band, like we're hardly looking at our instruments. We don't care like what the next note is. It's most likely going to be right. So we're like, all right, let's just have fun and go nuts. And, you know, we put on the same show, whether it's three people in the crowd or 3000 people. Uh, I don't know that it just feels good to just know that you're doing good work, you know, just to go up there and just, you you know, we did our jobs. Like, uh, I mean, one thing about my band that I've kind of heard our bandmates say was just like, man, like we just never really got the chance. Like we never got like to the top or whatever. And I was like, you know what? We had like a ton of chances. You know, we got some great tours. We're signed to some great labels, had some great people behind us, but dude, we did a hundred percent. Like we took a hundred percent of the shots we needed to take. Did we, we honestly did our best and like had so much fun doing it. Yeah. Sometimes when you, you know, I guess, blow the next band off the stage (laughs) you know when when, like and you know bands will come up and joke like how are we supposed to follow that yeah but at the same time they're thinking i I don't care i'm getting paid 10 times more than you tonight like whatever right you don't need you don't need to be good to make money and to have people like you which i mean 
a lot of the bands we toured with are all great. I mean, we didn't tour with any bad bands, which was awesome. You know, we refused quite a few tours. Right. <laughs> Out of principle. Wanna, sure. Right. We didn't want to see some terrible music every single night. Yeah, everybody was cool. Well, it's, you know, just, it, it, uh, it's, it sounds like, too, and I think that there totally some there is so many valid points in existing, as you guys did, where it was like, obviously, you, you, you played for many years to very few people. That gave you the time to, you know, obviously not only be terrible, but figure out what it is you're trying to do as a band. And it gave you that important developmental stage because I think that the, you know, the bands that obviously that you're talking about where it's like, you know, they're like they're hardly moving on stage. They're just, you know, it looks like they could be playing their record as a backing track and they're kind of moving around, but not really. Um, yeah. The, the, those bands, they've been kind of, you know, forced to perform on this weird stage that they haven't been able to kind of feel comfortable on because they've become popular quicker than they should have been you know um right absolutely and so it it gave you guys the yeah the ability to be more self-aware of where you kind of stood not only on that particular bill where you're out on a tour but just kind of where you are as a band because you had that perspective as opposed to like all right we're at the top of the mountain there's literally only one way to go from here and that's down (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, the, the developmental stage that you mentioned, it's it's so true. I mean, going from we, I booked all of our tours from 2006 to 2008 and we probably did like six U.S. tours a year um, at that point, including some Canada and stuff. And yeah, like we would play a show and then afterward, you know, we would kind of think like what what, what could we have done better, I guess. Hmm. And it was like, hey, man, like during this part, can I just go nuts? It might make like two or three of those kids pay attention right i was like oh okay cool and then it was like little things like at the end of our songs people can't really tell when the end of the song is because like there's a bunch of feedback and guitar noise let's all roll our volume knobs down at the end of the song all at the same time make like a big cutoff Mm -hmm. and then we were like oh okay like let's try that and actually that became something that we called the sweller's stop uh (laughs) i love that we basically Dude, we just became like we had a bunch of different band members, so like you know we had to kind of teach them every every few years. A new guy would come into practice, and we're like, okay, by the way, end of the song, hit your tuner pedal, roll down your volume, just make your instrument completely silent because there's nothing better than a song just being like, Dah! and the crowd being like, whoa, that went from like 120 decibels to zero that fast, and everybody did it at the same time. You know that just something like that is just so cool sounding. Yeah. So yeah, we we kind of just like developed these little things, and we're like, all right, like. You know, and also like growing up with bands like the Suicide Machines, for example, Mm -hmm. they would play like seven songs in a row right? and then be like, hey, guys, what's up? We're this band. Okay, show's still going. Here we go. And, you know, like we used to play one song at a time because we only had, you know, six or seven songs that we would play on tour. And then I was like, dude, let's do like four songs in a row and then do like the last three and then just then we're done. We talk once. And then, yeah, people started being like, yo, that's, that's punk rock. That's seriously cool. Right. Uh, you know, and like the punk fans kind of liked it and they got it, but like we would go on warp tour and stuff, you know, years later, you know, some guy in some way bigger band would watch our set and be like, oh, yeah, just, I think you guys should take more break. And we're like, what? Like, <laughs> like we did not grow up with breaks in our set. It was like, you guys get 25 minutes. We're like, okay, we're going to fit in like 32 songs. Here we go. <laughs> you, you know, even if we have to play them faster or whatever. Right. So, you know, just little things, you know, in that developmental stage kind of took shape and made us who we were. So then when you put us in front of like 3,000, 4,000 people, at like, you know, like a Paramore show or like a big festival, you know, like we would read reviews and stuff and they were like, these random kids from Flint, Michigan, just that uh, we thought they played basements and stuff. And they just like owned this entire big venue. Right. And it was rad. And we were like, oh, that's great. You know, because I, you know, it's, it's all about working the crowd. You know, it's like you could just be shy guy in front of the microphone, but we're trying to prove to people that, hey, you should like us. We really like what we're doing. Right. We hope you have a good time, you know. It shows like you were speaking about earlier. It's like you you work on the craft of what it is to be in a band, which, you know, makes it sound like it's like some, you know, stupid art project or something like that. But there there <laughs> there's totally elements of that because at the end of the day, it is entertainment. As much as there's obviously a lot of other elements that play into, you know, performing live music, that that's essentially what it should be. Even if you are an extremely political band, you need to have some entertainment element put into it in order to kind of, you know, get people interested in that. I I like the way that you you guys were, um, you know, framing it where it was like you prepared 
And then once you had an opportunity to get in front of those people, you were prepared as opposed to being like, you know, oh, crap. Like, I, I so I always remember this particular moment in my life where it was like this uh, on a much smaller level. But it was like my band was playing in we were playing at this huge show in Corona, California, at this place called Showcase Theater. It was like overcast, shy halud. It was like a big hardcore show. There's like 800 people there. And we nice. we were like the big local openers. And I distinctly remember we played a song and a half. And our guitarist broke a string, didn't have a backup guitar. We didn't have more strings. So I sat there on the mic. Hey, does anybody have a guitar we could borrow? For fucking like ever. It was like 10. Ugh. And it was, it was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I guess we should have been prepared for that. We weren't. We're stupid. We're children. And we learned from it after that fact. But it's like, yeah, you don't want to make those mistakes in front of those people. And it's perfect. You guys worked on the craft of being in a band because that's awesome. Right. Dude, the Showcase Theater in Corona, we, we played like our first two California tours there. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's so weird because, you know, there's like random blips of memories that I have <laughs> over the years. Yeah. One of them is like walking around in Texarkana, Texas <clears throat> on like my flip phone, like, you know, before Internet was on phones and everything and just kind of being like, oh, I got to call home. Right. Like that's for some reason one thing that comes up. And then the other thing is always at the Showcase. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some Mexican restaurant down the like next door or something or like right down the way. Yep. We got food from there. Um, <laughs> and yeah, just kind of, Those- I remember just sitting on the stage with all of our gear before we were playing, just thinking like, it's cool that I'm in California. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's like the only, that's like the blip of memory that I have. <laughs> yeah. 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 Back- it's like the most irrelevant moment to anybody. Like you describing those things could make people fall asleep, but they are so crystal clear in your head that it's like man that was really meaningful at that particular moment (laughs) yeah it's so weird man like i started having like not really panic attacks but kind of like like recently you know since the band called it a day we were just kind of like yeah i'll be sitting at home i'm like oh yeah like wow we started touring in 2006 okay that was eight years ago i was this old Mm -hmm. and then i'd be like whoa like 19 year old me was doing this <clears throat> and I had these friends. Then I'd be like, oh, like, Oh dude, I might not ever see them again. Like, I think I'm done touring now. Like I might not see these kids from Omaha, Nebraska ever again. Right. And I might not see this truck stop in Iowa ever again. Like, Whoa, like, ah, and I would freak out for a minute, but then I'd be like, Oh man, like some of those times really sucked back then too. Like, Maybe it's a good thing I won't ever be at that truck stop again because <laughs> yeah. there was a crazy ice storm and I almost died. And, you know, like everything just comes back. Right. And it's it's so cool that I have, you know, a million tour stories. But, you know, that's the thing when like an interviewer, they'll always ask you the same question. Like, tell us a crazy thing that's happened on tour. Right. And that's like that's like me coming to you and going, hey, dude, think about the last eight years of your life. Give me a. Give me a funny, just random funny story. Yeah. Just in that last eight years. Hurry up. Right, pick it. Right, now. go ahead. And it, and it better be entertaining. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always just like, God, I, I don't know. Like, we got stuff on YouTube. Right. Some of that's funny. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but, totally. It's those, yeah. it, it's, it's definitely those, those interview questions that are just, I mean, that basically it's like, that's what I rally against in every conversation I have, where it's like any sort of trope. And even like, honestly, even for preparing for speaking to you, it was one of those things where I was like, I don't want to harp on the band breaking up. But then I'm like, well, no, but like, that's like, so I have to like, sometimes I have to switch that natural instinct off of like, oh, dude, don't ask that question. It's like, they've been asked that a million times. But it's like, well, no, sometimes there's interesting things that could come into that. But, But yeah, the idea of, can you summarize the, you know, your last record in like 40 words? Why are you asking me that? Dude, it's so weird. Like whenever we make a record, it's, it really was kind of like the same type of thing where I was like, whoa, we got all these songs. Hey, they're kind of coming together. Oh, we got them demoed. That's cool. And I'd be like, hey, Jonathan, like we should record this. And he's like, I don't know. Let's come up with like a plan. And I'd be like, oh, actually, while you were responding to me, I just booked studio time. We're making the record in four weeks. Right. Cool. And he's just like, oh, crap. Like every single record has pretty much gone like that, <laughs> where it's like ups and downsizing, you know, like Fueled by Ramen was talking to us. Right. Because they, they heard our demos. And I was kind of like, hey, guys, um, will it hurt our chances or make you mad if we just go ahead and make the record? And they were like, um, I guess not. Like, go for it. So, yeah, we ended up making ups and downsizing not on the label, no intentions of signing to any specific label. Mm -hmm. You know, like we really wanted to sign to Fueled, but it was kind of one of those things where like, this will be more organic and like 
I can't wait. Like, I need to get this out. Like, I, I need to put the, get these songs going. And then, you know, I think it was like seven months, eight months later after finishing that record, that's when we finally got to put it out and decided on the label and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, knowing both you and your brother, it, it's funny to hear the way that you guys both work where it's like you... You know, you you always strike me as the type of person where it's like you're, you know, you're very focused and driven up to up to a point of like, okay, I'm going to make this thing into a reality. I don't have all of this lined up yet, but I'm going to make this into a reality. Whereas your brother would have something completely like mapped out and planned out before it gets quote unquote launched. Whereas you might launch something 75% done, but the, the other 25% will fall into place. Trust me. Um, Dude, that's ex- that's exactly okay, what okay. it is. I mean, and my brother and I were fifty fifty songwriters in the band and everything. Uh-huh. So you know, like when I have an idea, Jonathan will be like, "I don't know, wait a second. <clears throat> so like, let's say I was about to do something right now, and then Jonathan's like, "Let's do it in four weeks." It would pretty much get settled, and we do it in like one and a half weeks. Like we would kind of meet halfway, but I would like you know go in a little bit quicker than he would want, but. So far, you know, so good. Everything's kind of made sense because I think if we sat around and just tweaked songs for too long, it would just, you know, it would kind of lose some of the magic. Like I'm a big believer in like you get in the studio and kind of like you get what you get. Right. There was, uh, I think it was on my Everest or even ups and downsizing. I wanted to like redo some vocals. So like I went in and like redid some and I was kind of like, man, that kind of blows. Like the magic's gone. Like it wasn't the same version that I heard. So, like, I vowed, like, never to, like, have to go back in and redo something. Hmm. Like, whatever's on the record is on the record. Like, that's that time and place in my life, and that's awesome. Right. So, like, I, you know, I record and produce bands now. Uh, Well, I have been for a few years, but a lot of people will call me, like, a week later and be like, there's this, like, one line I just don't like, the lyrics. And then they tell me their new line, and I'm like, dude, to me, it doesn't make any difference. You recorded that in my vocal booth, and... You came all the way from, you know, whatever city. Dude, just let it be, man. It's it's rad. Trust me. Right. And they're just like, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, so sometimes I got to talk people out. Like, because you, you can second guess and tweak and edit stuff forever, and then the record will never come out. Yeah, no, so like, for the, sure. You'll, got, you'll, be cri- you'll be crippled by your own devices. Right. And, I mean, Jonathan's like that, not just with the band, but, you know, with life in general. You know, he, you know he'll stress out a little bit more than I do, and I am the opposite where – I'm like, it's fine. Everything's okay. Don't worry about it. Right. You know, and like, I have that mentality, like, we're just worm food anyway. We're all going to die. Who even cares? And it'll be, let's just have fun. And, but then, you know, Jonathan will kind of bring me back down to earth. Like, dude, there has to be a couple of you know guidelines. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You guys are the yin to each other's yang, which is good. Yeah. And it, it's always been, you know, that way it's been good. Like, I, you know, I was talking about training to be a professional wrestler Mm -hmm. like November of last year and I was just like man it's like it's in the palm of my hand like I could totally do this and then he just kind of goes well you're talking about it so you're probably gonna do it and I was like (laughs) yeah you're right actually so like yeah I just I I went to pro wrestling school at the beginning of this year you know I lasted a good month and then I was kind of like my body hurts I miss home I'm going back. Right. So, you know, I got I got my good, you know, month of getting beat up in and I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was awesome. But, you know, it's one of those things I just had to do then. Otherwise, I would probably never do it and kind of beat myself up over it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I know you're 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 putting the plan into motion um, and then your mind can eventually catch up. And then hopefully maybe once you've your mind is caught up that you'll be in that space where it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. Or if your mind does catch up and it's like, no, this isn't right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's like that that was one of those things where it was, you know, like being in the band, you always like you you question it all the time. <clears throat> like every year, even when things are going well, you're like, should we keep doing this? Is it worth it? Are we still having fun? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that's kind of something that you ask yourself when you're doing anything that requires your time, I guess. And uh, yeah, the pro wrestling thing, it was just kind of like, I don't really have an end goal. I'm just doing this for fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, I just got married. I should probably go, like, hang out with my wife instead of, like, hang out with sweaty dudes. Right. So it was, <laughs> it was like, one of those things. And I, like, just come home from tour and then got married and then was in a wrestling ring. Right. Yeah, you're like, I, so it was, let, me, let me balance out the priorities. Right. So it's like, you know, I got what I wanted out of it, which was the cool part. It wasn't, like, a failed thing. It was, like, a, 
okay, I, I think this is all I needed. Right. <laughs> so then I was like, all right, man, cool. You know, I don't want, I also didn't want to start, you know, from the very bottom of an entirely new industry. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, starting a new band with zero contacts and stuff, <clears throat> zero experience, is really tough. I mean, it took me, you know, 12 years of being in a band to, like, get to where I am right now. So it's like, man, like, if I wanted to start anything else from the ground up, like, that would really suck. Right. Like, being, being 27, because, like, 12 years from then, I'm going to be this old. And it's like, oh, man, that's a long time. Right. So, yeah, right now I'm kind of in that, uh, I'm just like happy to be home, happy to be chilling kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely the moment in which you, you can obviously like re- reflect on, I mean, it, it's a new chapter. It's one of those things where it's like you, like you were talking about, the dust is settled, the plans to definitively end something. I'll put out uh, my experience in regards to my original band breaking up where it's like we, you know, two dudes quit one practice and it was like in November and we already had enough songs for an EP. So we had this weird process of like, okay, well, we're going to record this EP. We're going to play some final shows. Like we knew we were not going to be a band for like a year, but this is like prior to the internet age. This was like 2003 ish, 2002. So we didn't need to like put a statement out there or anything like that. But it was that weird procession towards the end, which is what you're in the middle of right now, where it was Mm -hmm. like, okay, like, even though you don't have a record that's kind of inside of you, or maybe you do, but you, you know, you're planning final shows and there's these things where you can kind of put the, the proverbial cherry on top. Um, but it does, it does open you up to feeling like you can have these different experiences because you don't need to worry about where am I going to be in a year? Like, I'm going to be on tour. It's like, no, like I'm here open to stuff. Yeah, dude, that, that is like the ultimate freedom right now. I think one of the worst things was like, let's say I'd get to be home for six weeks. And, you know, I would tell my, you know, then girlfriend, you know, now wife, like, hey, I'm home from tour. You know, it's so good to be home. And like the first thing we would probably both think of was cool, six more weeks to this and then you're gone again. Right. Like there's always that countdown because, I mean, my band, yeah, we were a touring band, but dude, we were a touring band. Yeah. Like we were always on tour. And I mean, at first it was just kind of reckless because it was like, me booking so i'm like we always have to be gone like we can never be home so you know we were doing like eight months out of the year and then when we got a booking agent and started getting more and more bigger tours it was like nine months out of the year and it was just like man and i would be hitting up the same people every few months like hey man we're in denver They're like dude weren't you just in denver it's like yeah yeah we're back and like actually bill stevenson you know black flag descendants bill mm-hmm. uh he did our record in 2011. He actually was like, dude, you guys tour more than Descendants did. <laughs> Holy shit. And I, and I was like, did you just say that? It, was just, uh, it like blew my mind, you know, and like, you know, Bill said a couple of things, you know, just because obviously we're not the most like punk band, really. Right. You know, like, you know, every bone in my body is punk rock, but, you know, we're not the punkest band. You know, for him to kind of like, he almost like gave us like the thumbs up being like, yeah, you guys are cool. Like you stay on the road, like that's great, you know. So I was like, "Oh man, dude from Black Flag said that." Yeah, like, we're legit. That's yeah. So you know, that was one of the cooler things that's happened. You know, among like a thousand other things at the Blasting Room when you know we were recording. You know, getting to see half of the Descendants practice at like six a.m. You're just like, "What? Yeah, what's going on?" You're like, "Could I exist here forever?" <laughs> yeah, just absolutely nuts. But the weirdest thing was like when you're sleeping in the bunk beds at the studio, and like it's like the sixth time that they're practicing. Mm-hmm. And you're like, God, like, would the descendants just, like, shut up for a second so I can keep <laughs> sleeping? Like, that's when it got weird. You're like, wait, no. That, I shouldn't keep playing. Right. Like, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be saying that. My, my, my body and my sleep deprivation is telling me otherwise. But this is so cool, but not. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was just an awesome experience out there. And Yeah. No, that's yeah, it, super cool. It, it's rad. The, the one thing I find so interesting, and I know many people have, have, have spoken to you about it, where the – you know, the the fact that obviously it's like, you know, you and your brother playing in a band together and then having your parents be um, supportive over what you guys did when really they, they had no reason to be besides the fact that they, you know, love both of you as sons. Um, and then obviously the developing relationship that you had to have with your brother to not um, kill one another in the context of just professionally wanting to kill one another and then being creative with one another. Like there's so many layers to that. Uh, that I'm sure it was, I'm sure you have moments where it was like extremely difficult to navigate or certain aspects were were easier than others. Like my brother and I didn't really get along as like pals fully until we both started playing an instrument. You know, he was nine years old playing the drums. I was 10 years old playing guitar. Mm -hmm. 
we would get in the basement, which, you know, he was afraid of, like he did not like the basement being a drummer at nine years old. He's just like, yeah, like it creeped him out. And he didn't really like playing drums either. Like he just was like, yeah, whatever. Like I'll play drums because you play guitar. Right. And then, dude, when punk rock came around, that's when it all changed. It was like he was listening to Mill and Colin records and MXPX records and no effects. I mean, he couldn't really play the no effects stuff. But, you know, he would just like dig it. And yeah, so we would just listen to all this music and like pretty much just try to play it. And then he would love getting down in the basement and getting on the drum set. You know, punk rock pretty much just made him love playing. And I was just like, this is great. Like we got something going here. And, you know, my dad, he isn't a musician himself, but he just loved the fact that we were into something because like, we were both like chubby unathletic kids to actually give us a hobby was like really rad and he also liked music gear so he's always like you know shopping and buying selling and trading gear you know through ebay because ebay had like just come out dude ebay was scary back in the day it was you were always told never to even tell anybody your first name on the internet like (laughs) that was like that's like what they used to say you know like now it's like you have like your address and zip code and phone number on your facebook it's like what what's going on so yeah i mean ebay was a little bit sketchy back then but uh yeah i don't know so then when we wanted to start touring i don't even remember like i think what what it was was that we were going to sign to nitro records Mm -hmm. which my dad knew of because he knows of the offspring because i'd listened to him all my life okay and uh dexter holland owned nitro records and we were signing to them so my dad was just like whoa like that's that's a big deal uh-huh. and i'm like yeah dad like afi and the vandals were on nitro too and our buds in a wilhelm screen and uh he's just like wow yeah so when your little brother's out of high school i guess you know try the touring thing see if you like it you know so they let us use their van and you know we bought a small trailer and we just went you know we just did tours and then nitro kind of stopped being a thing mm-hmm. and i remember like looking at my dad and just being like yo so uh yeah nitro not really panning out. We were on a small label at the time Mm -hmm. called uh, Search and Rescue Records. You know, they taught us tons. Like John Woods is the guy who uh, runs that label. And yeah, he was kind of just like, dude, I'll do your full length. I don't care. So yeah, then we did My Everest on that label and just kept touring. We just kept going. At that point, I think my parents just kind of realized this is like what we, you know, there was never like a, you guys should really think about the future. You guys should really like go to college, whatever. My parents didn't start saying that till seven years later. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like it was like last year when my parents would be, you know, calling us from they live in Alabama now. Uh, they'd call us like, you guys have to realize the band won't last forever. You need to figure out what you want to do just in case, you know, not like yelling at us like you guys are failures, but just being like, you guys have been doing this so long, like what's next? And then, you know, so that that was kind of in the back of our minds, like, yeah, you know, what, like what is next? Dude, I'll, I'll tell you right now, like the end of the band, like mm-hmm. as we know it, this is what happened. We were in the UK. That was like our last tour that we did. And we had such a good run and we had so much fun. And I think it was like an I Am The Avalanche tour or something that was happening okay. that they wanted us to do. So I was like, sweet. Yeah, love I Am The Avalanche. You guys rule. Like, let me go talk to my band. Talk to my band. And, uh, you know, Anto was like, oh, well, I mean, I might have this, like, vacation thing. And I don't know if I'm, like, going back to school around then or what. And then Ryan's like, dude, like, my job is really, like, pushing me up, like, the totem pole. You know, I have, like, health care now. I just don't know, like, how long I can be gone, really. Mm-hmm. And then that was, like, the first time there was ever, like, a, hey, I don't know about touring. A pushback, sure. Yeah. And then, you know, my brother, you know, and I, we were both like, well, I mean, the tours, like, we wouldn't be getting paid that much, which is, you know, weird. Like, money was never really an, like a, a problem. But after you've been a band for so long, it's like, dude, I'm not afraid to get paid anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, I've been playing so hard and sweating and, like, bleeding. You know, it's like, dude, you can, you know, you can throw me the extra 50 to 100 bucks, like, that you're not wanting to give me right now. Mm-hmm. So, and, like, the littlest bit helps, you know, it, it helps you eat for, like, that week um you know bands don't make a ton of money at our level but yeah so i kind of was like whoa like maybe and then i don't know i I just kind of like i took a walk i was with jonathan and he was just like dude i don't know he was the one who wanted to keep the band going forever and ever sure and um i was always like dude there's got to be like an end at some point like we're gonna get so bummed at some point that the band's gonna need to be done and we were talking about how good the tour was going how much fun we were having and then this is like we kind of just came to the conclusion we're like let's just do some final shows in the fall and we kind of looked at each other like wait is that is that it mm-hmm. 
we're like, are, we're like, are we ending the band without like some big bad thing that happened? So it was just kind of like the discussion just kind of happened when it was like, dude, let's stop trying so hard. Things weren't really coming our way anymore in the way of tours. Um, the people who worked for us, you know, in all aspects, weren't working as hard for us because, you know, we're not really top priority anymore. We're not like the young bucks that are going to bring in the money or potentially bring in the money. Right. So we were like, you know what, man, like it feels crappy to kind of just try so hard, like to, dude, I want to get this tour so bad and then not get it. And then, oh, but this tour is also going on and it's our friends band. They'll take us out. And then they don't take us out. And it's like, crap. And you start really just getting let down. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, like we started doing our own tours and stuff, you know, in place of those where like the money was better, but like the crowds were smaller. Sure. So, you know, there's the trade off. So, yeah, we were like, okay, let's do some final shows in the fall. We'll keep it really down low. Let's not talk about it, really. Talk to the other guys. And they're like, oh, wow, like that's kind of crazy. But like I never expected it to end, really. But yeah, okay, I guess. It's the interesting thing about that that conversation and that moment is when something that literally is not in your head and then when you have that open conversation, that's when all of a sudden like your mind kind of explodes where you're just like, oh, there's an alternate path that I can take. Like, yeah, this, this, because, you know, you kind of feel like a, uh, you know, you're on this this perpetual motion machine that is your band and then you know, stepping off is, is like not even, you know, it's like, it's like jumping off a treadmill. You're like, Oh dude, I'll get hurt. Like, Oh, this will be bad. And so, right. and so having that discussion, I'm sure was just like, I, I mean, in many weird ways, liberating to a certain extent. Yeah. Dude, we played the last show in London and there was like 250 people there, which for us is like a very, very good show. And it was probably one of like the better slash best shows that we've ever played. We walked off stage and we were kind of like, man, awesome tour. And then we flew home and on the drive home, we were like, we got these two Canada shows coming up next weekend. We got to drive like 24 hour round trip to play these two shows that are probably not going to be that good, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And then Jonathan's like, well, we wouldn't want to bum anybody out by canceling. And I was like, yeah, but kind of who cares right. at this point? We've been pleasing people for 12 years and building up a good reputation. Like, you know, there's not really word going around like, wow, those Swellers guys are flakes and like they're <laughs> mean. And, right. You know, like we're, we're pretty nice dudes and, you know, we show up when we need to or early, you know. So I was like, dude, let's just say we can't play the shows. No one's going to get their feelings hurt. No one's losing money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hit up our agent. I We hit up the venues and we're like, dude, I just don't feel like driving 24 hours to play two shows after we just flew, you know, nine hours from England and are trying to catch up the whole jet lag thing. And we just ended on such a high note. So that was our last show that we've played was London, England. And dude, we, yeah, we canceled those Canadian shows. And we were like, oh, like, it was like the biggest sigh of relief. Like, oh, man, we're done. Like, that's so great that we didn't have to go do that this weekend. <laughs> I was really dreading it. Right, right. Which is weird, because that's the first time you're ever like, well, you feel like it's a, you feel like it's a job at that point. It's it's not, well, not even a job, but you feel like it's an obligation rather than you know an event that's like oh right. this is oh I'm like you said I'm not looking forward to this and it's like yeah yeah why do you need to beat yourself up over that yeah so like now I'm booking our last shows and it's kind of getting it, it's not as stressful because I don't care so much right but you know it was like okay look, where do we want to play. And everyone's like, you got to come back to, you know, I don't know. Yeah, Lubbock, like, Texas. Right. Yeah, just come back. Come back to the panhandle of Oklahoma. We love you here. You've never been here. Right. And we're just like, dude, we want to go have some fun and play places that we know a lot of people will come see us. Sure. Uh, places that are kind of easy to get to. Like, you know, we'll probably fly out to California just for like a handful, small, small handful of shows. Right. And fly back. And dude, we're not going to make money doing that, but yeah. we, we just want to say hey to our friends one last time and cover the expenses. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, like the Midwest and the East Coast stuff, that's kind of like right over here. So, you know, we'll probably hit some stuff like that. We don't know what's going on with Europe and UK, but, you know, we're not going to say like last show ever, like at any given point. But, you know, we might say like last show in the US, mm -hmm. you know, when we figure out when that's going to be. Right. But, you know, I don't want people like flying from Australia to the u.s to come see us if we're somehow gonna play australia again yeah. you know before we hang it up so it, it's confusing yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, the door is open and yeah you don't you don't want you don't want people bringing in baggage to their expectations of this show and then all of a sudden be like oh well i just did i went i jumped through all these hoops and you guys are still not yeah so i i understand you're 
yeah. you're navigating the weird waters of that. But I, bef- before we moved on, I wanted to hit on the, the kind of the topics of of you know, what, what you were alluding to earlier in regards to being an opening band on shows and like you know never like getting a lot of opportunities to you know kind of quote unquote make it and be that next big band and um, right the because I think there's something there's there's a very interesting thing that that happens with bands that essentially are just kind of you know the mid-level bands where it's like yeah they have pockets of people that really care about them and it's awesome and they can draw on these certain territories or cities or whatever you want to call them but they you know they haven't crossed over they haven't crossed over to some you know they're not like fun or paramore like all the, obviously all the mainstream successful bands you can point to or like a, yeah. or like a rise against there there does become this weird world of they're your friends bands that are kind of slugging it out with you on the road but then when a band that you're friends with gets an opportunity that you don't you immediately have a chip on your shoulder with that and not like a negative like i fucking hate those dudes but like a uh, man how come we didn't get that how come we didn't get that opportunity? Cause I, I can, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience, not trying to put words in your mouth, but like, I definitely, there were bands that, that existed during the time when my band taken was around that got swings at stuff where I was like, shit, like that sucks. I wish that we could have done that. Um, and we, you know, by all stretch of the imagination, were like much smaller than what you guys are and were. Um, but you still have that weird feeling. Um, so I'm sure that was something that you guys, when you were doing those yearly checkups on like, do we still enjoy it? I'm sure there was elements of like, God, it's fun, but like we keep getting, getting kind of beat up or pushed aside or we're not, like you said, the, the young hot band that's getting brought out on tour. I realize that's a huge thing I'm asking right now, but I'm no, just kind of trying, trying to lay, yeah, trying to lay the, lay the groundwork for that thought. That's a hundred percent accurate, man. And I mean, you put it in a nice way, you know, like the way now that, you know, I'm past it now, but there was a solid two years where it was, it was straight up jealousy Mm -hmm. and anger. You know, obviously these people were still our friends or our acquaintances, but the bands that really started blowing up, I mean, you should have heard like the talks we had in the van, like, especially Anto, Mm -hmm. he was the one who would always stop and ask like, why are we not huge? Mm -hmm. Like, did you see that set we just played? And, you know, and that would make me smile because I'm like, dude, you're right. We did play our hearts out. And, like, that's job number one. And, like, we accomplished it. Awesome. But, like, we can't let anything else get in the way. But then, you know, like, when you, you, when you start feeling, like, old news or, like, you weren't, you know, given, like, the, you know, the shot at the big times, really, that you feel like you wanted or you feel like you deserved, you know, you get angry at everybody else who does because, like, you find things wrong with their band or things that your band, you know, you think you do better than they do. And you're just coming up with all these reasons and explanations and trying to figure it out. But then I think after we kind of stopped trying so hard and stopped worrying about it, like, all those feelings turned into just a huge pat on the back for all of them. It was like, dude, good for you, man. Even if you're, if we think that your music sucks or whatever, mm-hmm. awesome. Like you're playing music and you're going on tour, you're entertaining people. This is art, right? And it's so hard to get to that point. Like, dude, good for you. Dude, even the worst bands in the world that are out there right now making so much money that everybody just hates, that have terrible reputations, like whatever. I'm just like, dude, awesome. Right. Like, I, I don't care anymore. Like, I'm so pumped for you. And like, that's 100% genuine coming from me right now. And you know, that's the thing, like, we never really super, super disliked any of the bands in our scene that were doing better than us. Like, I mean, they're all killing it. And they're obviously with our kind of music, you can't suck and like pull it off. Mm -hmm. You know, like, especially like this new pop punk thing. You know, I think, like the end of it, there was there just wasn't that kid that pressed like the these guys are cool button. You know, we were like, I think that's kind of what happened because sometimes like a band would come out and I'd be like, wow, they're boring, super boring. Right. Like they sound like everything else. And then you could tell some kid just hit like the, no, man, these guys are cool. They came from hardcore. Trust me. Right. Like even if they're a pop band now, like, dude, I'm pressing the button. And then every kid, you know, was just all suddenly like, oh, man, this is the new band to listen to. You know, this is what I want to check out. Uh, just no one ever pressed the cool guy button on us. Uh, And I think it could be because, you know, we were, we did a tour with Paramore or a couple tours with Paramore, you know, we were on a big, pretty much major label. So it's kind of hard to like, just feel cool, like be that kid in the flannel shirt that's like, yeah, man, I fully dig this band that's on Fueled by Ramen. Mm -hmm. 
So, so then it's like, man, should we have signed a fuel by ramen? Like, did that hurt us? Yeah. You start, but, you start to play those games in your head of like, yeah. what do we, what if we did this thing? You're right. And like, I can tell you right now, we could have signed to another label and had more cred, mm-hmm. but we wouldn't have been able to do some of the like crazy life experiences that we got to do like touring the Pacific Rim with like one of the biggest bands on earth, right. you know, playing in like Bali and uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, you know, like stuff like that. Um, you know, we would never get to like travel to like a high rise in New York to go visit our label. You know, there was just like all these things, you know, like sitting in the office with like the owner and listening to some of your demos and them saying like what their plan is for your record. You know, these are all things that, you know, you see in movies and stuff. We we're like, wow, this is so cool that we get to do that. But yeah, you know, like other labels were talking to us quite a bit. And, uh, you know, one of them being Epitaph, mm-hmm. you know, right right down the street from you pretty much yep. at PETA. And, uh, you know, we visited. They talked to us on the phone. I mean, dude, it's Brett Gerwitz. Yeah. It's like bad religion, man. Like <laughs> right. him talking on the phone to us, he like knew mine and my brother's names, you know, just from the get go. But the thing was, like they'd been talking to us for like three weeks Fueled by Ramen had been talking to us for about nine months. Okay. So we like we kind of felt more of this like family thing with Fueled by Ramen. Like they they hung on to us and they were rad to us all this time. Sure. And then what it came down to, we asked Fueled by Ramen, like, well, how many like what's your deal? Like signing bands, like what's going on? And they were like, You guys are the only band that we're signing this year. So we were like, Whoa, dude. Yeah. Like we are the only band that you're signing. We're the new band. They're like, Yep. And they they stayed true to their word. You know, they act that was true. And then, you know, on a phone call with Epitaph, they said, like, you know, we're going to grab, like, a whole bunch of, like, just super great punk bands and get this roster going again. Mm-hmm. And that kind of turned me off. I was like, I don't want to be part of a bunch of punk bands. Right. But, like, some of the things that, like, Brett said about our band and, uh, you know, our so- like songs in particular, I was just kind of like, man, <laughs> like, that's so awesome. Right. So, you know, it, it makes me wonder, like, should we have gone back and gambled you know, just to like be part of that. And I think that that is one thing that I kind of wish we could have done was like do something with like fat records or epitaph mm-hmm. uh, at some point, even just something little. Cause I mean, that's, that's legitimately what like made the swellers happen in the first place, you know, like listening to those compilations and stuff like that. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you, the, the gene and the DNA that the swellers exist in are because, you know, survival of the fattest existed. It's like, that's that, true. Man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to hear the, 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 that you've obviously, you know, been able to push through the, the weird feelings that, you know, be, that you get when you are in a band that, that slugs it out for a long time. And, it because to me it, it's not so much the 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 negative thing that comes from the feeling of jealousy and stuff like that like that's one thing and that's something that you know hopefully you can push through to me the more sad thing that i see especially from bands um that exist in, in our ecosystem is the bands that you know hold on too long where it's like right you there there's there's nothing more um honestly sad and not sad from like a oh you're not making money, but just sad as like a human to human basis where it's like you don't feel like the members of of that that particular band can kind of turn the corner like what you're doing right now where it's like there's obviously a lot of fear and a lot of insecurity and a lot of stuff that is all wrapped up into that, but you've turned a corner whereas other people can't and they're just like crippled by the fear of what's on the other side. And that to me, that's the most sad thing where you're just like, you know, you're watching bands do 10 year anniversary tours for records that were not relevant then and not not remotely relevant now. And it's dude, that, that's exactly we had that talk. Like uh-huh. uh, my brother and I, you know, we're like, man, like it'll be next year. It'll be 10 years since our first EP came out. Like, man, let's do like an EP show. And we're like, dude, we sold like 2000 of them. <laughs> like what? Right. So and then like, you know, we looked at our newest record, The Light Under Closed Doors and I was like, man, I love that record. My brother's like, yeah, record rules. It's like my favorite one. It's my favorite songs. And, uh, you know, that we were like, that's pretty cool that we're ending on that record. We're not going to try to just pump out another one and see how it does. Like, that's a good place to stop, you know? Like, Big London Show is a good place to stop. That record was a good place to stop. You know, we're not looking like this old, tired band, which is was not the goal ever. You know, the goal was to, like, you know, 
it's better to burn out than to fade away kind of thing, you know, as you know, not to, not to reference Kurt Cobain's suicide letter, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah. <laughs> comparing it to our band, but uh, you know, like it was just kind of like, it makes sense though. Like when we tweeted guys, we're done. Thanks for everything. Mm-hmm. And like, that's it. That's all we said. I mean, for some reason, I don't know. People thought it was a joke. Like, I don't know why a band would joke about that. I'm sure some, <laughs> some idiots do, but yeah, we're we're a band that's been around forever like if we say something like that like dude we mean it Mm -hmm. um but yeah you know and then of course all the emails and phone calls came in and dude and it's and dude honestly there are probably points on this podcast where i sound really cocky uh and i mean at this point dude i'm okay with that like i don't mean it that way i'm just saying what other people have said i'm just going through things in my head that i've thought about for years finally letting it all out but like, dude, the band's not really a thing anymore. So like, I'm cool to say whatever we want. Like, dude, my band ruled. Yeah. Like, dude, we, we had so much fun. And we made like all great records. And I'm cool to, I'm cool saying that, you know, because I love it. It was my, that's my life. Well, you could be, you're, uh, you're proud of it. There's a difference between thinking that you're the shit and being proud <laughs> of something. I don't, I don't think, I mean, if someone is listening to this and, and has feelings of, you know, Nick is being really cocky about that, like that, uh, I mean, that's misguided because it's, you should, you should, when you're putting creative stuff in the world, no matter what it is, it's putting a piece of you out there for people to judge. And that is not something that should be taken lightly by anybody, no matter how good or bad it may be in your own eyes. Like that's still a piece of that person. And right. yeah, so you, you have every, you know, I, I will give you the pass, Nick. You're allowed to be proud of your records, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And that's the thing too, like you said, you know, it's, I guess it's not an ego thing at all. It's just like a dude, like, wow, I'm pumped, you know? So, um, you know, and the, the way you can tell, you know, that I don't have an ego is like, I can tell you when I've completely been at rock bottom, but have still had a smile on my face, you know, like sleeping on like literally a rat infested floor Mm -hmm. in some basement of a, like an abandoned dress factory in Southern Indiana, you know, like, and these are things that they weren't like when we just started, these are things that have happened decently recently. Right. So it's kind of, well, I didn't mean for that to rhyme. That was kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, decently, recently. That's a <laughs> no, no. Song. Well, dude, you have those, you have those moments, those, uh, I like to call them like the gut check moments of, yeah. <laughs> of where it's like, yeah, I mean, you, your dress factory in Southern Indiana was my bathroom in Montreal playing in front of, you know, 20 people and none of them were there to see the band that I was playing in. And it's like, yeah, you, you if you don't have those moments, you're not really... Um, I don't think you're having the full whole experience that it takes to, like I said, you know, being a band and be creative and stuff like that. Cause if it's, I mean, Dude, yeah. yeah, if it's the same thing as a relationship, if your relationship is like easy, you know, with your significant other, I don't think you're doing it right. You're not challenging yourself. Like, right. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, dude, I gotta, I gotta tell you about some stuff that, you know, I've been, you know, just talking to my gym buddies about and stuff, you know, kind of keeping it down low. But I might as well talk about it here. You know, like two years ago when I moved to this town, I live in Saginaw, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Dude, I was getting recognized by people. Like I'd be in a grocery store. I'd be just anywhere. People would be like, oh, my God, like you're the dude from the Swellers. And I'm like, yeah, man, like cool, thanks. Now, like a year later and this year, dude, not a single person has recognized me like anywhere, even at our own shows, to be honest. <laughs> uh, like they don't know I'm the singer. Right. Um, but – It's just kind of like that's one of the things that helped me realize like our time, our big time has like passed, you know, like we're not the hot new thing right now. And dude, kids, they stay the same age. Like we all get older, but like the kids who like this kind of music, there's just newer and newer kids every year, Mm -hmm. like those like 14 to 18 year olds. So like when we had our solid four years of just like boom, 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 dude, those kids have, are like grown up and they probably have kids and they're graduating from college now. They don't go to shows. And it's just so like when we were at Warp Tour last year, Warp Tour 2010 was this big thing for us. Uh, autograph signings getting stopped left and right. And now like 2013, there's kids in man overboard shirts running past me that have never heard of my band. Right. And I'm like, dude, we tour with man overboard in the past. Like, we kind of we come from the same place. Like, what's going on? Anytime a kid would run up to me and start like tugging on my shirt at Warp Tour, it was like, "Can you go please find this guy backstage?" And I'd be like, "I don't even know who that is." Wow. And then the kids would laugh at me because I didn't know the singer of like the main stage band or whatever. And like, I, it's like 
I, I'm so out of the loop, you know, with that kind of stuff. You know, there's like Warp Tour famous yeah. and famous, you know. So I, I don't know who these people are. These, you know, some of these guys hide on their buses. Mm-hmm. One band I do have to call out for being rad dudes, though, uh, our buddies Chiodos, dude. Yeah. Uh, on Warp Tour, that band was killing it every day mm-hmm. on Warp Tour. They were one of those bands that could have just been hiding and being like, oh, we're just so cool. We're just so good. They weren't, dude. They were out hanging out, always had a smile on their faces talking to us. Uh, Craig, you know, Sarah, yeah, yeah, yeah. just being, you know, being a bro. Like, they were just great, like, having so much fun. But all these other bands that were like, you know, because Chiodos has been a band as long as we've been a band. I was going to say, started- you, yeah, you know why they're doing that is because they've got past the stupid, egotistical whatever that they've been involved in, not only as a band, but personally. And they've gone through like real life shit to be like, right. hey, we're really glad we're here at Warp Tour. Dude, it's true. And you could tell, yeah. you know, in their performances and stuff. And, you know, then there's these other bands that were just kind of hiding out, you know, that I didn't know. But I also don't care to know. It's like, whatever. It's fine. Yeah. Like, no no harm, no foul, I guess. But, but, dude, the thing now that I'm dealing with that's getting frustrating, like, on one hand, we're getting people saying, like, your band was legendary, like whatever, you guys have a legacy. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that's so nice of you to say, but like, whatever. But then on the other hand, I'm getting people hitting me up and basically devaluing, unintentionally devaluing like my last 12 years of hard work. Mm -hmm. And by by basically being like, hey, dude, like, heard the band broke up, like, sorry about that. Um, Hey, like, for your final show, would you guys be cool to play like this benefit show for this person that you've never heard of eight hours away from you? Uh Uh, We can't pay you though. And that's such like a crappy position to be put in. Yeah. Because it's like, of course, you want to benefit whatever benefit it is and help a human being. But it's like, dude, uh, it's like for our final show, you want us to drive all this way. And dude, not to mention our band members live like four hours away from each other in some cases. Right. Uh, We're not like a band that hangs out you know, unless we play a show or go on tour, because we live pretty far away. Um, And like, I have to kind of, I've gotten several emails like this. And also just kind of people being like, hey, man, like, cool, uh, you know, come play this show or come play here. And I'm just like, man, can we let me yeah, can we do our own thing? We want to control the way we want to go out. Right, right, right. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm getting all these people like, it's like, hey, man, our band's done. So like, people will say like, oh, dude, well, since your band's done, dude, I'll take over all your booking. Like, I'll put out your records from now on if you want. Like, basically, people are trying to get, like, a piece of the pie. And, dude, we don't have any pie left. That's why we are done. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, it's over. Uh, and, you know, and I hate to say break up or, like, yeah, you know, the swellers are whatever. dead. Sure. I don't like to say any of that because, like, I feel like we're never going to officially, like, disband and never be a thing. Right. But, like, we're, 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 like, legitimately what it is is the band is retiring from the road. I mean, like... When you're like a 72-year-old man working in a factory, you don't break up with the factory and break up with like work. Right. You know? Yeah. It's like you're just you're just like, I, I spent my life doing this and it was good. Awesome. Done. Yeah. Well, I look at... Like I, mission accomplished. Right. I look at it too. <clears throat> at this day and age, bands don't need to quote unquote break up that don't have some sort of like acrimonious, bitter, like fallout between the members who like can't stand each other. They're not creative anymore. You don't need that. You just need to be like... Oh well, yeah, we're not like we're not going to tour anymore. So like the the way that you know this band to have existed is not going to happen anymore. So right. you can label it however you want to, but we're we're going to be a band. We're just creating stuff on our own terms, and that's kind of it. Yeah, it's going to be a big personal change for us. Maybe, maybe a little bit for you because you're only going to see us like maybe once every two years, which is kind of maybe what you do that in the first place anyways. So Right, right. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing I want to hit on before I, I let you go is like obviously the, the kind of, you know, like you were saying to earlier, the, the, the path forward in regards to, you know, like you said, you're, you're dedicating more of your time to, you know, production work and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, weightlifting, bodybuilding, personal fitness, like that's been a huge part of your life over the past couple of years. So what sort of, um, <clears throat> what sort of things are you just looking forward to beyond, like you said, just even spending time with your wife? <laughs> Dude, life got crazy in the past month. You know, my wife obviously was really sad when the band was done. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, she gets really sad when I go on tour. But like when the band was actually done, I kind of told her, I'm like, yeah, we're, we're, we're hanging it up. And then she was just kind of like, wow, um, you know, half smiling, being like, I'm so happy you're going to be home. But also like, 
man, like you've got to be bummed that like your life is kind of like this. She's known me ever since I've been on the road for like nine months. Like she doesn't know the me that stays at home. So, uh, you know, first I was like, are you still going to like me when I'm home all the time? And she was like, yeah, of course. And I was like, okay, that's a good place to start. And then, um, you know, people were commenting and like saying things on different podcasts about the band breaking up and all that really nice sentimental things. Um, and to be honest, I didn't realize we meant so much to so many people. And that like was really touching. It was awesome. Uh, and then, of course, there was a bunch of just angry people that were just really pissed off at us for breaking up. But like, whatever. That, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm upset, too. But, uh, you know, the records will always be there. So they shouldn't be that mad. At least they'll have those. But uh, yeah, dude, pretty much one weekend, we got puppy fever. Uh, we ended up getting two puppies. So I have been raising two crazy baby animals. Sure. For, for the last month and dude it's taking over my life right. like i'll sneak out of the house to go train you know do some like weight lifting and i'll come back and then i'll have a band come in the studio and the dogs will just be barking up a storm or like every 45 minutes i'll go up and make sure that they're doing okay go take them outside yeah pretty much dude i'm, I'm really into the whole fitness thing especially being a plant eater you know i've been doing that for 12 years right uh so i kind of wanted to destroy that stereotype of like, you know, kind of wussy, skinny, vegan kid. And it's working, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty cool. And like, to be honest, I'm kind of following, you know, what all like the big old roided out bodybuilders who eat tons of meat, I'm following their diet plans, kind of, but substituting everything and trying to keep it as clean and healthy as I can. Mm -hmm. But yeah, still eating a lot, lifting a ton, like I lift heavy, you know, just kind of powerlifting stuff mixed in with bodybuilding. So that's something I'm really passionate about and love. So I might, uh, you know, get into something like personal training or coaching or something like that eventually when I can find the time. It's just great. You know, I've been helping people out via email and, uh, you know, in person even. I'll just like hang out with some people and kind of uh, walk them through some stuff. And it, it's just super fun. It's super rewarding. Yeah. You know, same thing with making records in my studio. Bands are coming in. A band from Quebec that came in. A band from Philadelphia just all in the last month. So it's it's really cool that people like my style and like whatever I do enough to kind of come to me for advice or to like make their record better. And, you know, obviously I'm the kind of person who can't sit still and do one job or do one thing. Um, so it's like... Yeah, you're just, if, if I, you're, you're, you're spreading yourself to a lot of different things that you have an interest in, which is exactly what you should do when you're trying to kind of, you know, piece together what you want to do with your life moving forward, which is awesome. I mean, it's just cool that you, another thing that I feel sad about when you do, you know, mentioning bands that kind of don't have a leg to stand on and stay around longer than they should in the same way that they've always tried to in the past is like, you also get the sense that these uh, individual members lives don't have anything else to move on to that they are interested in, you know? And it's like, you, yeah. you feel like you're like, well, what do you, what else are you interested in besides like playing music and do, you know, playing video games. It's like, like literally that's it. That's all you have? Like nothing no, nothing else. And it's like, wow, man, like, okay, you don't have anything else. So do your band thing, I guess. But it, it's it, it's cool to hear, obviously, people like you that, you know, can turn a corner and be like, oh, yeah, I'm exploring all these other interesting fields that I just haven't simply had the time to dedicate myself to because I've been, you know, playing so many shows a year. So it's, it, right. it's, it's, it's encouraging. And I think ultimately that's the message I think I know that you and, and myself included want to give to people that have to transition out of whether it's a band, whether it's some other creative outlet that's been like consuming them. It's like there, there's options. There's always stuff out there that you can do. And it doesn't have to be this, um, it could be a difficult transition, but it doesn't need to be like a depressing transition. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm kind of in the position right now where, I could just be like a stay at home dad for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Like my wife is an accountant. Obviously she likes my financial help, you know, so I'm pretty much there. I pay pretty much the mortgage and bills and then, you know, with her money, you know, she'll spend it on all like the nice things that I would never buy. Like, oh, we need like this nice new like thousand dollar couch. And I'm like, what? Right. Like, what are you talking? But you know, she works hard. She deserves whatever she wants. Like lawn furniture, you know, like patio sets, mattresses, bed frames. And I'm just like, dude, like this is so out of my like I sleep on floors. Like I don't even need a bed. Right. Like I don't I don't need this. But then I'm like, dude, I have a house now, I have a wife. I'm just gonna like accept all of it and love it. And I'm like, this is great. So, you know, I would feel like a sack of crap if I didn't contribute financially to the household. 
and it helps that I work from home quite a bit, you know, with the studio stuff so I can take care of the animals. Yeah. So I think like I, I'm probably just going to be my own boss as long as I possibly can because I have been like all this time so far. Yeah. I don't know if nine to five is really me unless I could find something that was nine to five that was like absolutely perfect. But like living in Saginaw, Michigan, your options are kind of limited. So yeah, man, if I could lift weights and make records and also write music and like play in like other bands, things like that, dude, I'm happy. Yeah. And then, you know, I have time to spend at home too. So yeah, that's kind of a, that's, that's my goal that's, just to kind of be able to do everything I like to do. Hopefully get paid for some of it yeah. and then uh, chill, you know, living the dream, my friend, living the dream, doing my best. I really, really appreciate you opening up, Nick. I, I know this was exciting for me to do and I, I hope you uh, exercise any, uh, any quote unquote demons you wanted to get out there into the world. <laughs> dude. Absolutely, man. It's just kind of a, like the moral of the story, I guess, be happy for everybody. Yep. You know, like there, there's times when, you know, you're down in the dumps and you want to take it out on somebody else and say, what's, what's the reason for this happening to me? And you're like, oh, it's this band or this guy's fault or this label. And it's like, dude, it all kind of just all happened, you know, and that's it. You know, it was, it was a nice story Yep. and we had a blast, you know? So yeah, I just hope, uh, hope everybody takes care of each other. Bands keep helping each other out and uh yeah i mean you're definitely not gonna this isn't the last from me musically that you're gonna hear same thing with my brother yeah you know the other guys i'm sure you know everybody's a musician so they're not gonna sell their instrument and then uh, right. you know never hear from them again <laughs> yeah yeah it's like see you later that's it closed up shop <laughs> yeah so yeah last show's coming up uh close that chapter and uh then yeah i'll probably freak out and i'll have a meltdown and then that'll be fine and then you'll have a record <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, then I'll have to make another record. Great. So it'll be solo acoustic folk, which is kind of what every punk rock lead singer does and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But yeah, that'll probably happen. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> so that was Nick. I was just so glad that he wanted to open up on this forum. His brother also wrote a great piece on Noisy, which is the Vice music blog. Uh, you can just Google that. Jonathan Diner, Diner, I think so. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a regular contributor, but he wrote a great piece on the band's breakup as well. So listen to this, read that, and it'll give you a nice full picture of what it's like to be in a mid-level success band. So thank you very much, Nick. And the producer, as always, is Tom Richfield on the show. Visit 100wordspodcast.com. Visit propertyofzack.com, our media partner. And like I said, the native sound. Go to their website. They've got a ton of music up there and order stuff using the coupon code 100 words and you'll get 10% off. I promise it's worth it. I did it. I didn't cash in on my own coupon code. I just did it out of the goodness of my heart even before he decided to come on as a sponsor. So that's how much I support this label. So next week we have the guest, Mike Mowry. He is a manager at Outer Loop Management and he manages a ton of bands, a very long history within the context of independent music. So I'm looking forward to bringing that to you. And until next week, be safe, everybody. Everybody.